Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Sonny Salter Pace, Hargis Associate Professor of American Literature at Auburn University. We will discuss her book, Imitation Artist, Gertrude Hoffman's Life in Vaudeville and Dance, which is published by Northwestern University Press. So welcome to the show, Sonny. Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you reached out on Twitter. Um, This is a really fun and interesting book about uh, an art form and period in American history that I've always found really, really interesting. And I look forward to talking about it, about it with you. Um, For listeners who might not be so familiar with that period and the figures in it, I wonder if you could just say a little something about who Gertrude Hoffman was and what she's remembered for today. Sure. Uh, Well, part of the reason that I wrote this as a biography is she's not very much remembered today. A lot of the things that people remember about vaudeville are sort of uh, memories of movies and TV shows way after the fact, but this is a woman who was really central to American vaudeville in the early 20th century who didn't make it into the histories that got written by sort of mid-century. And it's um, performance historians and especially dance historians who have reminded people of the work that she did in the past, um, well, in the past 10 or 15 years or so, although there was one scholar, uh, Barbara Cohen Stratner, who wrote about her starting in the 70s. But it's a it's a revival of her career because I think it's really important uh, and tells us a lot about how vaudeville worked um, as a space of imitation, borrowing, and sometimes even outright plagiarism. So during the time period you cover in the book, which is pretty broad th- throughout Hoffman's entire entire life, what really did vaudeville look like? What was the experience of going to a vaudeville show like? What kind of performances did people do? And what were people expecting to see when they went to a performance? Yeah, uh, vaudeville was a variety performance. Variety was a central part of it. And it was um, a lot of stuff. They tended to have a pretty structured bill where you would have early performances that people could watch just while they were walking in. So an animal act or acrobats. Uh, And then you would build up through the beginning of the first act with singing, um, dancing, comedians, and you try to have something pretty spectacular to end the first act and get people talking when they went out at intermission and then build up in the same way in the second act to a headliner Um, But yeah, it was, it was anything from trained dogs or trained seals to um, Bill Robinson tap dancing on a staircase to a really big spectacular act with a lot of sets and a large cast, which is what Gertrude Hoffman was best known for. Sometimes they called them flash acts because they were flashy. Well, so maybe you could talk then a little bit about Gertrude Hoffman's sort of own performances and the kind of specialty or specialties that she developed over the course of her career. In other words, what was she best known for? Sure. She was best known for two things, Uh, imitating other stage performers who were popular at the time and... Um, getting naked. (laughs) Um, Not always at the same time, though sometimes. Um, The nudity part came from um, she did an imitation of Maude Allen's Salome Dance of the Seven Veils that was being performed in London. Um, She went and observed it in London and came back and performed it 
in a roof garden over the summer uh, before Maud Allen was done with her contract in London um, and performed it in a very skimpy costume uh, with a prop John the Baptist head, which people were sort of torn about whether it was supposed to be, you know, very serious or and artistic or kind of comical um, because she was mostly known as a comedian. So that was the act where she combined the two different things she was known for. But um, yeah, she was known for imitating um, other uh other celebrities at the vaudeville stage and the Broadway stage. That's the thing that really rocketed her to stardom in the early 20th century. Well, so maybe you could dig a little deeper then into the Salome performance, which was really interesting. Sort of what was the original Maude Allen performance like? How did Gertrude Hoffman make it her own? And sort of how did Maude Allen and the people backing her show react to Hoffman's uh, decision to sort of, I guess, sort of send up Maud Allen's performance or at least sort of, you know, do her own version of it. Yeah. From the history of Salamania, which is what people have taken to call the period when the Salome performance style was really popular, um, it really starts with the Oscar Wilde play of Salome and then the opera that's developed from that and uh, solo female performers like Maud Allen are inspired by the character of Salome in that opera and start um, performing solo versions of kind of an imagined Middle Eastern inspired Dance of the Seven Fails. Um, this tended to have a lot of arm movement, a lot of hip isolations, um, but it was not anything very, um, I don't know, authentic to the area. It was sort of, an, it was very much an imagined version of um, the Middle East that was being represented in this dance. But Maud Allen performed it at first in uh, private homes for wealthy people. And because of that, she got, um, she, because of her performances, Maud Allen was booked to perform this dance in public. And Gertrude Hoffman was known to be an imitator, was known to be able to copy other acts very well because of her comedic acts as an imitator. Uh, so Willie Hammerstein, who managed the um, roof garden at the Hammerstein Victoria, he sent her over to London to copy it, um, to observe it, and to be able to bring it back. And this is one of the things that really interests me is people were not sure about whether it was a send up or whether it was just a way of transmitting this dance to a New York audience before Maude Allen could get there herself. And that's, that tension was something that really interested me. Well, maybe you could talk a little bit more about that then and about Hoffman's process. Like, obviously we have limited records of the actual performances themselves, but to the best that you were able to kind of reconstruct what kind of Maud Allen did and what Hoffman did to sort of conceptualize and recreate Allen's performance, like what was Hoffman's process like? What was she trying to accomplish? And how did people perceive what she was doing in relation to both kind of intellectual property ownership and maybe also in relation to sort of industry norms or the propriety of what she was doing? Sure. So a lot of what interests me about imitation in vaudeville in the early 20th century 
is the way that it allows performers to take performances that were sort of perceived as highbrow initially and to move them into a more popular sphere. And that's definitely something that Gertrude Hoffman was doing. She, you know, she took the ocean liner over to London. She never met with Maud Allen, but she observed her performance um, more than a dozen times and took really good notes. And she had a background as a stage manager and set designer. So she had a really good eye for being able to duplicate that. Um, she brought that back, uh, but then she performed it in a roof garden, sort of an open theater on top of a vaudeville theater in the summertime. And that was a space where performance was much more supposed to be something fluffy or something light. So her imitation um, was going to be seen as a send up to a certain degree anyway, because that's where she was performing it. Well, so how did people react when she did that then? Like, I mean, did people see it as in some way a improper, unfair competition? Or was the kind of copying she was engaging in seen as being kind of part and parcel or maybe even fundamental to the nature of vaudeville performance? It was fundamental to the nature of vaudeville performance. And the people who had tried to um, tried to stop her from copying earlier, um, had gotten smacked down. You know, it was just seen as part of the professional norms of the time that if you were famous, if you performed something that was very popular, then it was going to get imitated by other people. And especially since this was something that was performed overseas and couldn't be brought there in the amount of time that Gertrude Hoffman could go there and come back. Um, yeah, it wasn't seen as any kind of violation of ethical norms or anything. Um, that's definitely a dance of hers that was received well. Um, but was also that people were scandalized by be more because of the nudity than because of the copying. Well, I was really interested in the book by your description of Hoffman's process, because I, I mean, initially you'd kind of think, well, you're going to copy something. You see it a couple of times and you sort of do a copy, but in your book, you, you, you observe that she like viewed this performance like a dozen times or something and was, was really sort of recreating her own version, drawing on certain elements. I mean, I wonder if you could talk about to the best that you were able to reconstruct that creative process. What do you think it was like? What do you think Gertrude Hoffman was trying to sort of achieve when she created these performances? You know, that's something that really intrigued me about her because we have this model of originality um, and copying as being in opposition to one another. And one of the things I really learned from paying attention to the way Gertrude Hoffman copied Maud Allen um, is the closest she could get the closer the closer that Gertrude Hoffman could get to the Maud Allen original, the more faithful she could get, the funnier the parts that were different were. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And that's a strategy that she used in a lot of her imitations. So earlier imitations where she was copying Anna Held, who was um, – Florence Zigfield's uh, common law wife, who was very cute and French and saucy, you know, she started by 
coming out on stage looking just exactly like Anna Held, dressed like Anna Held, doing facial expressions like Anna Held. Uh, so she started off being very close to the original, but then by the end, she... So Anna Held was known for um, being very expressive with her eyes. You know, she had a song called I Just Can't Make My Eyes Behave. So Gertrude Hoffman starts off her Anna Held routine very close to the original. So people who've seen Anna Held in person will appreciate the resemblance, but then just gets it more and more and more exaggerated over time. So her eyes are darting around at the beginning, but by the end they're rolling around wildly. Or she is talking in a saucy French pout by the beginning, and by the end you can't tell what she's saying, you know? So, and from from what I can tell with the Salome performance, it was really the same way. So she starts off, you know, really trying to copy it with as much fidelity as possible. But there's a review that I really liked that talked about, you know, by the time she's kissing the fake John the Baptist head at the end, she's sort of putting the actions in quotes and saying, you know, this is a property head and I'm giving it property kisses and um, that she could express that physically just seemed really fascinating to me. Reading the book, I got the impression that at least initially, some of her performances were almost like warm-ups for the real thing. But then later, she kind of became famous and well-known in her own right for doing these kinds of send-ups such that she sort of became the main act rather than uh, the sort of the the featured uh the 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 featured opening act it, it, do you think that's a fair assessment of sort of the trajectory of her career that's right that's right um with the Anna Held performance I was talking about um she was on um she was in a show with Anna Held and did her Anna Held imitation before the actual actress came out so that was just sort of a way of reinforcing the popularity of the person she was imitating, but she got so well known for this and became so popular for it that uh, it was upstaging the people she was imitating. And that's why um, some other vaudeville performers like Eva Tangway um, tried to keep her from imitating them because it was mocking them. It was, using something that they had invented originally. It was um, breaking the kind of implicit promise in vaudeville that when you copy something, you do it better, you do it differently, um, or at least that you give credit for it. Well, maybe you could talk a little bit about the Eva Tangway uh kind of dispute or, or controversy. Um, as I understand, it was like a performance called the Mary Widow Waltz, and it ended up being a bit of a spat between her and, and Hoffman. What was the performance and, and what happened? Oh, the Eva Tangway spat and the Mary Widow Waltz happened at the same time, but Eva Tangway didn't do a Mary Widow imitation. That was a different... That was a full-on operetta that was produced by Henry Savage. And um, so this was sort of a period of Gertrude Hoffman's life when ideas about imitation are changing and she's enough of an up-and-comer that her imitations are really starting to, to bother people. Um, so the Eva Tangway spat happened because they were supposed to appear on the same bill and there was an argument between the two of them about who would appear second to last on the bill and who would appear last. This was something that was seen as really important in vaudeville. It's sort of like, um, like, like billing, like billing your name above the title or something. Um, the second to last spot was the best spot because it was sort of the apex of that second act buildup. And then the last spot was usually 
another act that people could maybe watch while they were walking out the door. So neither one of them wanted to be in the last spot. Um, so Gertrude Hoffman skipped out on the double bill and went to Jersey City and did an Eva Tangway performance there. Um, so this was something that was really, you know, talked about in the press. They sort of, for all intents and purposes, called it a cat fight. Uh, and Eva Tangway and Gertrude Hoffman argued back and forth in the newspapers about which one of them was the imitator and which one of them was the true original. So it was really kind of a proxy way of arguing about, you know, what female performance in vaudeville was supposed to look like. But then the Mary Widow performance, which was happening as part of the same bill. Okay, so the Mary Widow's an operetta that came over um, in the early 20th century and was produced by this guy, Colonel Henry Savage. And even though um, people were dealing with professional norms at the time where if something was popular on Broadway, it would get mocked in vaudeville. Uh, it would get mocked in burlesque. It would get mocked in all of these different performances. That's sort of the high point that people took um, and imitated and made fun of. You know, it's sort of like um, getting made fun of on Saturday Night Live or a Weird Al Yankovic parody of a popular song. Um, but Colonel Henry Savage tried to assert that he had these rights where if people were going to parody the Merry Widow, they would have to um, pay him for permission. And there was a popular um, burlesque uh, performance duo that actually did pay him for permission. But basically, everybody else said, no, that's not how this works. We're all going to do the Mary Widow is a really popular Broadway show. We're all going to do spoofs of the Mary Widow. And people did. You can look through um, the variety um, back issues of variety that are available through the Internet Archive. And there's all kinds of spoofs of the Mary Widow. Um, people waltzing with brooms, people waltzing with people they picked out of the audience. Um, but Gertrude Hoffman got sued for her performance of The Merry Widow by Henry Savage. Um, she did a performance that was one kind of straight waltz and then one parody waltz and then a ragtime version of the waltz. So just kind of this excessive copying of copies of copies. Um, and yeah, they sued her to try to get an injunction and stop her performance. And, and what happened as a result of that lawsuit? Uh, Savage and the Merry Widow just got roasted in magazines and newspapers all over the place um, because there had already been some talk about the Merry Widow score um, borrowing from other songs. But what happened is by the time the case was brought, um, their lawyer, Nathan Burkan, um, and there's actually a really excellent biography of Nathan Burkan that was just put out through University of California, I'm not remembering the guy's name, but um, he brought up all of the different ways that the Merry Widow's plot and score had itself plagiarized from earlier works. And that was used as a way of arguing that Hoffman shouldn't be penalized for doing the same kind of thing herself. Mm, it's almost like a kind of unclean hands defense or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in that same episode, you talked about something that I thought was was really interesting. And to the extent 
that you know more about it, I was really interested to learn what you know, which was you, you talked about the protected materials departments where performers could register their acts by mailing in an envelope with a hard copy of the material. Like, what was that? Who was managing that? And how did it work? <laughs> Yeah, that's something that um, the people I know who work on copyright and performance are really interested in, too. So it seems like I should maybe follow up on that. Um, but from what I can tell, um, basically the way that people in the performance world would assert their claim to an act is at first they would write in to Variety and say, you know, we're the first people who use the word cycle to talk about a bicycle. So this other act that's a that's calling themselves a cycle troop needs to stop doing that because we're the ones who did that first. And people would do that with different things they did in their act. Um, the Hoffmans actually did it later in the 20s when they had um, – the Hoffmans would actually do it later in the 20s when they had a um, Hollywood musical-type act where they, they said that someone else had done that after them and had uh, unfairly stolen it from them. Um, but yeah, it, it seems like this was just the way that people could dispute ownership of different elements of their acts in a kind of unofficial way where they would send it in to a billboard and they could hold on to it. And if somebody disputed their claim to say, um, a Hollywood movie star inspired ballet, then you could say, no, I sent in my um, claim to that in 1922. You can go back through these files and look it up and you could settle a dispute that way. Well, it's fascinating that the Hoffmans would have been on both sides of this issue. It seems like, I mean, I wonder what, if anything, that says about how they personally conceptualized the nature of kind of intellectual ownership of these kinds of building blocks of creative elements in, in vaudeville and whether, you know, it almost sounds like there was sort of like a contestation of what originality meant for the purpose of vaudeville performance. Absolutely. And it's something that they were on the, it's definitely something that they were on the critical end of and on the, on the receiving end of too. Um, even earlier in their career, um, when Gertrude Hoffman went to Europe when she was um, going to see the Ballet Russe in Paris. Um, the Ziegfeld Follies that came out that summer, um, several reviews said, oh yeah, there's a bathing girl routine in here that was completely ripped off from Gertrude Hoffman. And there was a newspaper story when they came back from Europe where Max Hoffman, who was musical director and wrote ragtime songs, said, yeah, we went over to London and we went to a musical and the whole musical was based on a song of mine. So it's something where they borrowed and were borrowed from. Um, and from what I can tell, it's only once they're really established in the 20s that they start contesting people's use of their material. Yeah, I mean, it seems like such a common sort of trajectory to go from the up and comer sort of 
being really syncretic and borrowing from many sources and the established player wanting to maintain control and kind of propertize their place within the sort of economic world in which they live. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so Sunny, in closing, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why you think Gertrude Hoffman's story is important and um, revealing or informative for us today. In other words, what do you think we should take away from sort of the story of her creative career and the role that she played within the vaudeville world? And, you know, how can it help us understand the way we think about creativity, performance, and ownership of intellectual rights today? Sure, that's a great question. The reason I think Gertrude Hoffman's story is relevant today is because there is so much copying and imitation that's foundational to contemporary culture, to meme culture, to remixes. And I think it's useful to know that that has a really long history. Um, the idea that borrowing is more um, scandalous or is more um, outside of norms than creating something original um, that seems to be really relevant today. The thing that interested me the most and that was probably the seed for this book, even before I knew who Gertrude Hoffman was, is my interest in the idea that you might experience an imitation of something before you know the original, that an imitation might be your first introduction to something. So seeing... Um, send-ups of Rear Window on The Simpsons before you're even old enough to watch a Hitchcock movie. And I was really interested in the way that Hoffman used her imitations as a form of popularizing and spreading um, more sophisticated dance into areas that um, would not necessarily have seen it before. Well, Sunny, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, I really enjoyed reading the book. Uh, I didn't know anything about Gertrude Hoffman before reading it and was really intrigued and excited to learn about her. And I hope that listeners will check it out. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.